Hello, this is Newton Thomas Siegel, the cinematographer of a new film called Cherry, and this is The Go Creative Show. Hello and welcome to The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. My name is Ben Consoli, and today's guest is Newton Thomas Siegel, the director of photography for Cherry. Newton, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. Great to be here. Now, the movie is awesome. It is so unique. And I think from a cinematography standpoint, I haven't seen anything this ambitious in I don't even know how long. So I cannot wait to dive into this. But before we get there, I just want to mention our sponsor, MZ, Education for Creatives. And of course, encourage all you guys to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, where we have exclusive content just for our YouTube audience. All things, of course, at Go Creative Show. Dot com. So the movie is called Cherry. It's on Apple TV+. Plus. Um, Tom Holland stars in it, and it, it's this wild journey of Tom's character. He's a disenfranchised young man from Ohio. He meets the love of his life. He serves in Iraq. He struggles with PTSD and drug addiction, turns to bank robbery, and it takes over the course uh, of about 15 years. And when I mentioned earlier in the show that this was one of the most ambitious films cinematography wise I've seen in a while. It's because you chose to have the movies in six different chapters and you chose to have a different look in each chapter. Talk to me about that decision and you know what that means for a cinematographer. The decision really began the seeds of it or the, you know, the germination of it started in the book, which was written in chapters in different sections um, of this uh, character's journey over 15 years. The um, screenplay then followed this um, sort of structure. Um, and when Joe and Anthony uh, Russo uh, first talked to me about the movie, they expressed the desire to um, really uh, take that to heart and to um use the, um, the the sort of episodic quality of the story to um, find different recipes vis- of visualization that would express these different sort of phases of the of the character's um, experience and of this journey that he that he's taking so we, started looking at uh, reference images at um, uh, other movies, paintings, photographs, news clippings, all kinds of different stuff to find a language for each one of these chapters. And um, Joan Anthony had sort of kind of descriptions of them you know, or, or, or keywords of them that was were sort of like giving a feeling of genre, almost like where the early part of the film where Cherry meets Emily for the first time and falls in love um, was always referred to as magical realism. I mean, the chapter mm-hmm. was called like in the beginning, you know, um, but the, the 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 feeling of it was always meant to be. Um, uh, uh, magical realism uh, and basic training, which was called basic training, um, but was always referred to as absurdism. Mm. And then um, Iraq was titled Cherry, but really was Iraq was one section that uh, probably the only section that really. Um, underwent a sort of reconceptualization from and, and you the, know I, and I want to dig into each of these but I just want to kind of make sure people are up to speed with what we're talking about before we dive in because I, I think before we even get to chapter three um, cherry or, or really even basic chapter two because it's so drastically different than the beginning of the film I want to start at the beginning in the prologue in chapter one and kind of how you set the tone for these characters. So at the beginning of the film, before you even start shooting during prep, what are the Russo brothers telling you 
about these chapters to get your mind kind of going and start getting the juices flowing? Well, I think it's a little bit of what, what, what I was just sort of describing. You know, the, the first one, uh, we talked about it as magical realism. So we, we looked at uh, images for the, um, you know, the chapter where uh, he meets Emily and falls in love. And, and we kind of tried to find that, you know, you'd look at an image and you go, you know, we like this aspect of it and we like that aspect of it, but not that. And that would be how we got to sort of, you know, honing in on the, the, um, what the, uh, the, what the specific execution of that chapter was going to be. So for instance, in that chapter, um, we found that these Todd AO lenses, which are very old anamorphic lenses to develop first in the fifties, um, gave us some of this feel that was, you know, a part of a number of other things that we used to get across this sort of kind of romantic, uh, almost fairy tale, like, um, and you said Todd Ao anamorphics? Yeah, Todd Ao. Um, in the fifties, Mike Todd was a um, uh, 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 guy who was trying to promote uh, a widescreen format. Um, at the advent of television, the movie studios were all trying to figure out oh, how do we go one better. We have to up our game hmm. um, because. Television's going to wipe us out, kind of like they have to do now. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. And so that was one of the first big advents of this sort of exploration of how um, they could open the screen up to. Because you know, remember in those days, most movies weren't even one eight five; they were like one three three, so they were quite square yeah. and that fit n nicely on a television when it came in. But the studios were really like, well, how do we, you know? How do we make it more of a spectacle? And it was by getting bigger screens and having them go wider. So there was a lot of competing technologies. Um, you know, Panavision had their thing, and all these different companies were trying to promote their own widescreen um, formats. And uh, Mike Todd was one of them, and he developed um, this uh, widescreen format, and he developed lenses for it, which were basically anamorphic lenses. But at any rate, the... the um, the format, uh, Todd Ayo's format, never took off. It, it, it was beaten by other formats. But the lenses still exist. Um, not a lot of them, but there's a few sets around. And that's what we used for um, that portion of the film. That was the predominant lens. Well, what were the qualities of the lens that lended themselves to this kind of love story that was building between these two young you know, characters? It's a very soft lens, um, has a lot of sort of optical imperfections, um, but it has a very sort of creamy, dreamy kind of quality to it. In particular, as it falls out of focus toward the background and toward the edges, um, the, the colors and shapes in the background take on these sort of very odd um, kind of uh, uh, what, you know, we call bokeh or bokeh, depending on you pronunciation and it's almost like a kind of painterly impressionistic painting um that when you uh have a character like in a close-up or a medium close-up um puts you into this kind of slightly dream state that i i thought was very Sometimes I would marvel at, the, you know, looking at a frame with Tom and I'd be looking at the background going, well, look how beautiful that. And it would be just an out of focus, you know, wall with some lights on it or something or a tree with leaves. And you'd go like, oh, my God, it's so, it's so beautiful. Yeah. No, um, I hear like actually watching it in the outside. I think there's a scene when they're in um, a cemetery and there's a lot of close ups, very intimate shots. And you have a lot of these leaves behind them. What I was seeing and uh, was that it's almost like this, like a like a motion in the bokeh, like it almost yeah. is like a spiraling effect. It's there's it's really weird and it's different than it's different than what you know as you're as you're listening to the show and you're thinking about it. 
it's different than the bokeh that you're seeing in your mind. It has a lot of shape, a lot of movement. It almost like curves in a way. It's very, very cool and really interesting. Yeah. It, you know, it, it's a very, um, it has a very fairy tale like feel and it is different in each one of the lenses with the Tadeo's the 55 millimeter was like our, you know, I probably did have to move beyond that one lens, if not more. Um, the most extreme example of the more circular type of swirling uh, comes from um, uh, Petzval lens, which is a, um, mm. it's a uh, reproduction of a mid 19th century lens made by Joseph Petzval. Uh, and it's an, like an aperture plate lens that its um, design uh, cr and, and it's really impacted by the, uh, the uh, amount you open up the lens or close it down. It creates this kind of swirl of the edges of the frame. Um, and we use that in conjunction with the Tadeos for sort of very specific moments Um there's a moment, it, it, more than the cemetery, there's a moment where he first um, has seen Emily and he's now, <clears throat> she's come up to talk to him in the courtyard outside the classroom. And it goes from sort of the Todd A.O. Uh, coverage uh, to these sort of straight on close ups. And when it goes into the straight on close up of her, and it's really cherries like most, like, kind of you know he's he's falling his little heart is pitter pattering and yeah. um that's when we switched to this lens and took that quality of the of the um the tadeo and went one step farther um with the this 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 look it's such a great pairing because it really doesn't seem like you've switched lenses at all. It seems like it's the characteristics of a 50 or an 85, or, or it just seems like you've changed the focal length. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you know, hopefully, as much as I would admire the, the backgrounds and the edges, um, hopefully you're looking at the people <laughs> more. Of course. Uh, and, but I think uh, anybody, myself included, anybody listening to this show, are looking at everything. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's right. the fun but, of it. It's, it's, you know, it's one of those effects that can be, um, it, it can sit behind the performance and it's not like a, some kind of, you know, swishing fast 360 camera move where, you know, there's, there's no way of not uh, acknowledging it or knowing it. It's, um, it, you know, it's, um, you know, you're more savvy, uh, viewers will have noticed it and made note of it, but, um, I think it's the kind of effect and the way I think we use it in the film where it doesn't really um, draw you out of the film, but it, it it only actually draws you in and and makes the sort of subjective nature uh, of the film more that much more subjective. And I think that's a lot of what the, the, the effects that we were doing and the and the kind of tools that we were using for execution were driven by this idea that it's a strong statement, but one which sort of allows the emotional content of the film to be first and foremost. Yeah. I want to transition to the next chapter of the film, which is called Basic, and it chronicles um, Cherry's pathway through basic training. Um, talk to me about this, this uh, chapter, because it has a completely different look than the previous one in really every way, the lensing, the aspect ratio, everything. So talk to you about the, about this chapter. Well, you know, I mean, Cherry's a, he's a young man. He's still in college and he falls in love. He, he gets his heart broken um, and uh, decides his, his solution is to join the army. Um, and that decision um, ends up changing everything in his life for better and worse. Mm -hmm. Um, but in his case, mostly for worse. And once he's made that decision, he finds out that whole reason for him joining the army, the whole reason for him having his heart broken, uh, has gone away, but it's too late. Mm -hmm. So his world is closed in. The choice has put him in a box. Um, he's confronted 
face on with a pretty harsh future that he's just got to survive. He's got to get through. We look for a way to represent this feeling of being boxed in, of having this decision and the kind of power of being in the military right there in his face. Um, and also the way that he found this somewhat absurd, like it's so absurd that I'm here. So our solution was we went to a very wide angle lens. It was a 14 millimeter Sigma on a large sensor. So it was really more like maybe a 10 millimeter. And we brought the aspect ratio in so that it was uh, one six, six to one. So that was that feeling of being boxed in. And those two, well, those are two of three key decisions. The third being that a lot of the warmth and kind of um, almost a period like uh, feel of color that we had at the beginning of the of the movie with um, a lot of golds and oranges and reds were going away and leaving us with a very um, uh, kind of neutral, um, you know, s slightly desaturated, straight ahead kind of look, a, a, a color palette that was um, not inviting at all. That was just yeah. right down the middle, like you should be in the military. And those three elements, the color, the, um, the choice of lens, and the aspect ratio sort of defined um, basic training. Um, and we were very strict about that entire sequence is all done with that one lens. Mm. And that was a 12, you said? 12 millimeter? It was a four, four, 14, 14 millimeter. Um, but it really, when you put it on a sensor that big, it, it becomes like what we're used to, more like a 10, 10 millimeter. Uh, one what of the camera things were you shooting on? We shot this movie on the Sony Venice camera. So everything you none of the the camera stayed the same, but lenses mm -hmm. really were the determining the factor. Lenses from scene were to scene. the determining factor. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So what does I guess what does that type of a lens do as a viewer watching? What does that sort of lens make you feel like? Um, you had mentioned, you know, we're telling the story of uh, uh, Cherry making a decision that he now can't get out of. He's being boxed in. He has the heartbreak of a relationship um, and knowing that he made a decision based on something that wasn't necessarily true. So there's a lot of there's a lot of emotion going on. Uh, why did you pair that super wide lens with that emotion? Well, it was. Really, first and foremost, it's the emotion of, you know, it being in his face was that the the military and this choice to be in the military was going to be right in his face and there was not going to be any way out of it. Uh, wow. And you can look to the side, but it's right there. So we wanted that feeling that, you know, um, like a big wake up call, like a, a splash of water in the face to a sleeping man. Um, and the lens just really served that. It definitely gives you that feeling of you can't get away. Like it, no. you, you are on display. Everyone yeah. can see you. It's raw. You know what I mean? It's vulnerable. Yeah. There's no hiding. No, not at all. And so you shot the entire sequence with that lens. There Was there ever a moment where you kind of thought like, Maybe I'll sneak in another lens here. Like, did you almost have to hold yourself back from the temptation of switching yeah. lenses? I mean, the one tricky shot was actually there's a shot when they do the uh, uh, rectal exam where the camera's inside the rectum looking out at the doctor. Um, that was a little tricky. <laughs> but no. So you we, maintained we, that we, lens? Uh, I think we that was the one shot where we cheated a little bit, but not much. <laughs> um because and it was really like just physically tr trying to get in there, but we might have. I, I think maybe we did actually end up. Can't remember. Um, but it it's no, we were very religious about it. 
Um, and it meant that, you know, you had to not only, um, you, you know, frame for it, but you had to, to, to choreograph for it. It actually was a, was a nice exercise in that when you knew you were going to use this lens, you, you designed your shots and your choreography to fit the lens, you know? Because mm. um, you knew that this it was what it was going to be. You weren't, you weren't going to, like, rehearse a shot or design a shot in the abstract and then say, okay, now I know what I want the actors to do, what would be the right lens to shoot it. It was really... Was this is the lens we're shooting on? Now, how do we choreograph the action to fit the lens? Because we wanted this scene to be very subjective, to be very in his face, to be very personal. We always had to stage the scenes with Cherry very close to the lens, because like with any wide-angle lens, you know, when you're, um, you know, five, six, seven feet away, you're, you know, you're small in the frame. Yeah. And to get like a close up, you have to be like right, you know, right there. I can only uh, like. Did you know that the decision? Did you did you make the decision about the lens choice prior to even going location scouting or designing your sets or your scenes yeah. at all? Like you that must was have, a, yeah, because that was a decision that we made early on, mm -hmm. and because um, it affects everything, it yeah. affects everything. Yep. Yeah, that must have. Uh, did you personally like the challenge of restraining your, you know, tool set? Well, I didn't really feel like it was a restraint because it was, you know, it was what worked for the scene. So mm -hmm. it, it, it wasn't, I didn't feel like, oh God, this is so hard. I can't do this on a 12. It was kind of like, or 14, sorry. It was like, what, you know, what is the. Like, how does, I, I know the world I'm in. I'm in the world of this lens. So now how do I make the the, the scene work? Um, no, I, I, I enjoyed it. You know, I, I did one other experience working with extreme wide lenses, like for a whole, whole movie. Which was with Terry Gilliam, where, you know, a, a movie I did, like, he, he would want every movie on the tw 12 or 10 millimeter lens and, Sometimes you'd go in a close-up and you'd go, well, maybe we'll go to the 14, you know. It's like, and these are lenses that are ordinarily only used for wide shots or establishing shots. or, You know, in, in traditionally you don't use these lenses for a close-up, but, yeah. um, but we did. So you had some experience with it in the past, and I, I think it makes for a really great scene, and uh, it's a standout of the six chapters for sure. Mm. But then immediately following that, we have... The next chapter, which is called simply just Cherry, and now you're making a war film. I mean, this this <laughs> this yeah. movie has so many movies within it. Um, talk to me about the you know the unique kind of challenges or decisions that needed to be made to now midway through the movie, we're in Iraq, we're making a war film. Talk to me about what needed to be done in order to have that come across. <laughs> Well, if you think about it, you know, at the beginning, you're going from this sort of fairy tale, and then there's a, and this fairy tale look, and then, then there's a shock, and that shock is basic training. That's when it goes right there and right in your face. Yeah. So that shock stays true for basic training, and then when he goes to Iraq, it's time to get real, because it's no longer absurd. It's life and death. And boom, it goes to actually much more sort of journalistic than either the fairy tale of the beginning or the absurdism of basic training. So the frame widens back out to its original shape, which is a, a 239, you know, widescreen uh, format. And we switch lenses again. Um, and we go to... Um, the Leica um, still lenses that are used um, or were used traditionally by some of the great phone photojournalists like Robert Kappa and um, and um, that combined with a color palette that 
sort of is not um, stylized, but rather has the saturation of the sand and the desert and the environment. So yeah, there's a lot of warmth in that scene. A, a lot, and 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 it's the sand and the dust in the air, and and so we've gone to this, you know, from one extreme to another and then to another. So, you know, these shifts are are they're not subtle little like oh I think it's getting you know a wider lens now or they're like boom right in your face oh yeah you know? absolutely so now where where were you when you filmed that section where did you guys film we shot in Morocco okay. um and uh um we were in Ursulat and Air Food um very beautiful parts of a of a very beautiful country but yeah, it yeah. has enough similarities to Iraq that we could sell it. Let's take a quick break and talk about our sponsor, MZ Education for Creatives. Now, when you go to MZ, you will see hundreds of hours of high-quality video-based filmmaking education in all the categories that we know and love, like directing, cinematography, post-production, visual storytelling, and more. It's basically everything. Everything that we here at Go Creative Show want to know, want to learn, want to be better at. And it's all there at MZ. Now, you can go and buy individual courses, and that's great. Um, but I suggest you become an MZ Pro member because when you do, you have access to the entire library. Every single thing on there. And believe me, you're going to want it all. Because the education is fantastic, but it's really the secret sauce there is the trainers themselves. On MZ, you've got really world-class trainers. I'm talking about Vincent LaFerre, Shane Hurlbut, Philip Bloom. The Ari Academy is on MZ as well. And Tom Cross, the editor for La La Land in Whiplash, is on there doing a whole course on the art and technique of film editing. And there's just so much more. That's only scratching the surface. So best thing to do, head over to gocreativeshow.com forward slash MZ. Check it out for yourself. If it looks like something you want to participate in, and I think you, sh I strongly suggest you do, I get a little secret for you. On checkout, if you do GCS20 as your promo code, GCS20, you're going to get 20% off of whatever you buy there. So that is really just, it, it, it's a win, 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 a little, some extra, you know, some extra cash for you. It helps us here at Go Creative Show, helps support our show. And of course it supports MZ in the thriving filmmaking community at large. So check it out for yourself. GoCreativeShow.com forward slash MZ. It's time to hone your craft and be a better creator at MZ Education for Creatives. Now, talk to me about lighting for this, because in this scene, you're outside the most. I mean, you're basically out in the elements for practically the whole thing. Um, so how did you handle lighting for these environments? Well, you know, the the... Exterior stuff, you know, the one thing you don't want to do is start romanticizing it, right? I mean, this is this was war, so it's mostly natural light. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of, you know, bounce from a, uh, a, a, a textile or cloth. Um, and then, you know, in the barracks, the light is motivated um, more for, from the practicals, the, the fluorescence and uh, the kind of lighting that you would have in a temporarily quickly built barrack um but um really the the lighting in the iraq section is meant to be very sort of straightforward naturalistic um and um you know um and i think it lends itself to that photojournalism style that you were talking about and that the lenses yeah. are really for yeah i mean it you know it's a sort of documentary -ish style, but there is a counterpoint, which is when you go to the base, the military base, where the guys all stay. Because, you know, one of the things that I find very interesting is the way that when the military, the U.S. military goes to, like, Iraq or Afghanistan or these kinds of places, yeah. and they uh, build these what they call forward operating bases, they tend to recreate America. So they'll, you know, they'll make a little kind of environment where people feel very safe and, and, and um, surrounded by familiar 
things, not only their fellow soldiers, but, you know, Coca-Cola and hamburgers and hot dogs and ping pong yeah. and all this kind of stuff. So it's a there's a real sort of disconnect between the uh, environment in which the soldiers are, are housed and based out of and the environment into which they go to wage war every day. Um, so when we went to the barracks, the photography tended to be more... Um, uh, it, it wasn't so much that it was stylized as it was more, um, it was on dollies, it was um, more formal compositions, it was kind of more, you know, militarily structured, um, as opposed to when we were outside in the, in the, in the countryside of Iraq, um, or the desert, you know, where um, the the images were mostly handheld, or you know they had that kind of um, uh, roving documentary, not sure what's going to happen next style. So even within that chapter, you have some point counterpoint. You know the chapters are not like you know you said they were like little each one like a little movie. So if you think about it that way, the, even though you can think of the chapter as like a little movie. It's not like it's a one-note movie. So even within the chapters, you have sometimes opposing. Yeah, and near the end of that chapter, when he comes back, he's now back from home, he gets the Medal of Honor, and he goes back to his house that he didn't even know he had at the time. Like his, his wife, Emily, has you yeah. know purchased this house, and now he has a place to come home to. And when he gets there... The interior of this home is cold and dark and blue after having seen so much warmth in, you know, um, orangey kind of gold light out in Iraq. Now he's back home and he's entering kind of the next phase of his life, which I think carry through uh, chapter four and five, which is now he's struggling with drug addiction. He's struggling with PTSD and he really spirals downward. Um, talk to me about that transition from your standpoint, now you know we're talking about the darkest points of this character's life. What are the decisions that you're making in order to support that? Overall, riding, determining um, goal of that section is to communicate the way that after, you know, what was a very traumatic experience in Iraq, he comes home and it's not home. He's unable to fit in. Mm. He's unable to find his place. He, you know, while he's away, his parents help them buy a house. So his, his Emily, who he married like only days before he went off to Iraq, um, is, you know, making a home and it should be the most glorious time of his life. You know, he's survived the war. He's married to the woman he loves, and he's coming home to his new house. So we really wanted to communicate and 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 kind of emphasize this feeling of dislocation of like there's I have no reason that I shouldn't be in a state of pure joy, but um, I'm not. I I can't find my footing, and. So we, and, and that leads to dope life, but there is like a, there's kind of a, in his return, he, he doesn't fit in. He kind of hits a real low point, thinks he's found his way out, which of course leads to dope life. And so when he comes home in some of the first shots, we utilized um, these swing shift lenses, which would throw a lot of the frame out of focus. And um, it's only a few shots, but he's like, even the house, he can't quite, can't quite take in that whole house at once. Yeah. And you're referring to tilt, tilt shift lenses? Is that what you're referring to? Uh, yeah, tilt shift or swing tilt, they're sure. sometimes called, or slant focus, they're sometimes called. Uh, it's, a, it's a type of lens, which there are some that are more mechanical, some that are like bellows. But it's a type of lens that's been around for many, many years and was first designed to do architectural stuff because you could fix um, uh, uh, pers 
perspective distortion. Um, so, and that was really just a couple of shots. The One of the biggest tools we had for this dislocation, this feeling of being out of balance, was um, what I, I called the sort of the, the Mr. Robot um, section. Uh, and Mr. Robot is a television series that... Um, uh, had a really extraordinary use of composition and uh, unbalanced frames that, oh, yeah. uh, you know, I've tried to bring into my work over many years, but really never was able to more than a few shots here and a few shots there. And uh, when I saw Mr. Robot, I was very sort of like uh, envious that somebody got to really build that aesthetic into their whole show. Yeah. So, and, and what it, the, the way it served Cherry to me is that it it contributed to this feeling that he's come back home and nothing is fitting. He's always, you know, uh, getting out of the wrong side of bed and the other shoe is always dropping. And you see it when he goes to the theater and he starts freaking out because some guy isn't dressed fancy enough for him. You know, and, 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 and he knows, he can tell, like, I'm, I'm not, like, I can't, I can't find my way here. I'm lost. Mm -hmm. um, and we had established at the beginning of the film that he has anxiety issues and he's on Xanax. And um, he's, you know, he's very far from being, a, you know, super mental, mentally healthy kid. Um, but. He clearly, you know, wasn't he wasn't a, a traumatized person the way he is on his return. Yeah. So that imbalanced frame proved to be one of our sort of best friends in that section. And the, there's a little more color at the beginning, but it in the house as they you know, as Cherry gets introduced to OxyContin and he starts to go deeper and deeper into the drug world or into taking drugs. Um, and uh, the, the light in the house gets increasingly sort of sketchy and darker and uh, like the windows are more closed up and um, uh, it, it Eventually, it leads to drug addiction, um, and Emily sort of succumbs. And there's a there's a kind of a breaking point when uh, he comes home all high, and Emily just freaks out and says she can't take this shit anymore. And we did this shot where we built a little rig, my key grip, Jimmy Shelton, built a uh, kind of a rolling rig that Tom could stand on and we could rig the camera on and the camera and Tom would move together, but not rigidly. So Tom could like, you know, he could like kind of sway in the, f in the frame and work the camera the way he wanted. Was it like a, was it kind of like a snorry cam? I've, I've heard... I've heard that term where it's the camera. You sort of have a a, a, a waist, um, like a, a, a no, belt it's not, brace, it's, and the camera kind of sticks yeah. out like this. Yeah, no, it's not. Because when you do that, what happens then is the camera and you always move together. It's just uh, it's yeah. the same as holding your iPhone out and doing that, right? Yeah, but yeah. what this rig did was he and the camera are moving together through space, but he's free to, to play the frame. Mm-hmm. So he can bend over and he can do all this stuff like that. And he'll change position within the frame. Uh, and by rolling him around, what it does is, because he's not walking, you don't have the body language of walking, so you have somebody that's literally like floating, you know, ah, through yeah, space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We put a piece of glass in front of the, of the lens that I had found on the stage that was one of the few sets we built. Um, I just, I saw it in this like wood frame. I thought it was a prop. Uh, 
So I took the lens out and I put it on the front of the camera and it's what really uh, warped the image and created all that chromatic aberration that you saw, which is, you know, like the color fringing and stuff. Yes, yes. And um, and we wheeled Tom around and he did his acting and um, it drove her, you know, bananas. So it's sort of the gateway to what, what the section that's called Dope Life. And I just thought it was really important to get across this idea of Emily who had resisted his addiction and finally succumbs. And when she succumbs, um, it's at the conclusion of a... There's a scene with them in bed together and they're talking and and... It's she's fought with him about taking drugs, but now it's like fuck it. So here I am. I'm taking drugs. Boom. Yeah. And it to me it felt like they're going into a rabbit's hole. They're sinking into the abyss. So I knew they were going to be in bed, and and I I asked Joe and Anthony if we could build a set. Which, you know, should have had like eight foot ceilings or something like that, this bedroom set. If we could build it all the way up to the the ceiling of this warehouse that we were shooting in. So it wasn't that high. It wasn't as high as I would have liked, but it was a good 16 feet, 16, 18 feet, something like that. So the idea being that the camera is looking down on them. They're lying in the in bed and the camera's looking down in what we call a top shot and it and it pulls up and up and up. Now, to feel real, or to feel like you're really in this space, it should stop fairly, you know, fairly soon because it would hit the ceiling. But we keep going, like past where the ceiling should be. And what makes it feel that much weirder is, it's not like you're going through the ceiling and breaking the fourth wall. The walls are like 18 feet high. So mm. the camera is just going and going and going, and you're like, "Wait a minute, that bedroom doesn't look right. That's yeah, yeah, something is off here." Um, and to me, that was the transition into dope life. Yeah, and dope life for sure is my favorite. Just aesthetically, that's it's it's my favorite chapter of the film. It's the darkest, and it's when he is now you know having to become, you know, he, he trying to, he's got to make money in order to feed his addiction and bank robbery is the path he chooses. And, um, it's pretty wild because you're, you're watching the, the creation, you're watching the birth of a criminal throughout yeah. that whole thing, which I think is, it's, it's really interesting, but every single chapter you're watching Cherry discover something new about himself. But I think when you are in dope life and you watch him rob his first bank, that discovery, I think, was the most powerful of them all to me. Um, and I want to talk to you about the 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 technique that you used in making that um, bank teller kind of come out from silhouette. There's a lot of stuff going on in that scene, so, so I, I don't want to overload the question. Yeah. But I, I do want to talk about um, how you approached this scene, because this was when he finally discovers just how bad he's going to be. And he discovers that he is now... A criminal after being a war hero. Well, you know, his first bank robbery happens in a um, in, in a bank that we visited at the beginning of the film, or er, early in the film, where yeah. he goes and he tries to cash a check and uh, or to, to to settle up a, an overcharge, um, and the bank teller is completely unresponsive and he can't get anywhere, and when he does his first robbery, he returns to this same bank. Now, the first time he goes in and he's talking to the teller, the teller is just a black void. And the concept of that is that there is this feeling that the world doesn't see him, that he doesn't connect to what people do and who they are. 
we had a lot of discussions about it being a visual effect and what kind of effect would it be, and we don't want this, we don't want that. But uh, Joan Anthony never quite settled on any visual effect that they thought was going to work for this this uh, sequence. So on the day that we shot, I still wanted to sort of give a kind of lip service to the um, what was written in the script. And um, I actually found it one of the hardest scenes to light, only in so far as I wanted the environment to feel like it was all lit normally, like it was, you know, the sun's coming in the, the windows and there's a little bit of fluorescent light on and Sherry's at the, at the teller and the teller's there. But somehow, like, the teller is just absorbing all the light and like a black hole. Um, and you can't do that by just cutting all the light off of them because then, you know, you lose the light on the counter in front of her and you lose the light on her, all her clothes and stuff like that. So it was really more a question of lighting the, the environment naturalistically and then really cutting any light that would hit her face. Um, but then there's a moment where we decided when she does give the money to Cherry, we would bring the light on her face to see that sort of disappointment. Like, mm. it's almost like, you know. Because she knows him. She's seen him before. She's seen him before. Does she really know him? I, you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't well, I think what it is, what it is, is that she sees him. Like, she sees him for what he is. Exactly. And he, he's he, finally revealed himself to her. Yeah. And it's taken a bank robbery for the world to see Cherry. Hmm. That Cherry walked this earth alone, um, to quote the title of one of my son's songs. Um, <laughs> Your son's a musician? Yes, he is. Yeah. What's the name of the band? Plug it. Uh, well, if you... It's Don't Milo... Uh, D-O-N-T-M-I-L-O. And um, if you go to BeatStars.com, uh, you hear a lot of his stuff. He, he creates a lot of music that um, other musicians use to collaborate and stuff like that. He's oh, only nice. Four, he's 14. You, if you listen to the music, you, you'll, you'll go like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> that's mean? awesome. All right. Well, that's great. We'll put it in the show yeah. notes. Yeah. There you go. Um, so, you know, the teller sees him for the first time. He's he's made his mark in the world, and to do it, he's had to rob a bank, hmm. and he's he's now turned a corner. And he's, you know, he went over a line with the drug addiction. Now he's really gone over the line. And if you think about it, it's been one bad decision after another, you know, to join the army, to go to war, to come home and get addicted to drugs. Now, that silhouette and silhouette isn't even really the best word for it because it's not a traditional silhouette in the way no. you're thinking. Silhouette's it's easy, you know, I mean, yeah, it's 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 different. I mean, you've completely yeah. taken uh, the character has become a black a black void in the in the scene, and it yeah. looks like a visual effect. So it's really interesting to see that you've done that practically. But you also yeah. carry that through in a later scene in the hospital when Emily um, overdoses, and the nurses and doctors are also in that that completely like black void silhouette look. And I was wondering, is it something where? That's how he sees people that he wants things from. Is that is that like wh what is no, I what is his it, mindset where where those people that are kind of separating him from in the doctor in the hospital case the person he loves and in the bank case the money he needs is there something there? I think in the in the in the hospital it's much more that he um, it's a very dark moment. I mean she's overdosed on drugs and. He needs these people to save her life, and there, you know, he feels helpless. So he feels that you know th there is this infrastructure, this hospital, these nurses, these everything, 
but he can't, um, like, how does he uh, connect? And, like, he needs them, and they just, they want him to get out of the way so they can do what they have to do, which is what you do in a hospital, in an emergency situation. Yeah. Like, a, a loved one crying over the 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 patient doesn't really help you medically you know so (laughs) exactly so um but from his point of view it's like he can't reach you know like he's he's going he's really at one of his blackest moments you know where he's killed the one he loves he thinks now he ultimately gets arrested and goes to jail and in the epilogue of the film there is this shot which is my absolute favorite in the entire film mm-hmm. where you choose this very long tracking shot uh to transition between scenes from when he enters the jail all the way to when he is um you know granted parole and you the camera sort of dollies sideways as you transition from scene to scene to scene. And I just thought it was so brilliantly done and absolutely loved it and wanted to hear from you the challenges that you faced in order to get all of those scenes to line up so perfectly along that track. Well, you know, the the, the prison sequence was, was a, the challenge was not so much the photography as how, how you tell the story of a man in prison for 11 years quickly and succinctly when your film to a certain degree has already ended and there's a reason it's called epilogue that it's not you know like final chapter or something like that sure yeah um and the what happens to him in prison in our story at any rate is initially he's made a choice for the sake of the woman he loves, to let himself be caught and go to prison. Because he thinks if he doesn't, he'll end up killing her Mm. because of drugs. So he makes a choice to get caught. He's basically given up his life from his point of view. But there is a moment after some years in prison when he comes to the realization that, you know, his life isn't over and it's not too late to find redemption and peace so there's no dialogue in the sequence um, except a little bit of words at his parole hearing at the very end but it was all designed as a series of dolly moves in one direction which stop the moment that he makes his decision and he has his epiphany and he goes okay I'm I'm not going to give up I'm going to make something in my life and then same style of these slow connective dolly moves, lateral moves, but in the opposite direction. So he's turning his life around. Mm. And it was, you know, a very deliberate pace that we matched shot to shot. Um, very desaturated, colorless palette. Um, very... Um, the Tadeos were nowhere in sight. These were very sort of more classic, sharper, anamorphic lenses. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we tried to condense this 11 years into, you know, a couple of minutes. I think the natural instinct is to, like, montage. You know what I mean? Like, shot after mm-hmm. shot after shot, tell the story that way. But to choose this tracking shot, this dolly shot, I thought was... Just a, a really interesting way of telling that story after already seeing so many different styles of cinematography to hit you in the last couple of minutes with one more really unique shot. I thought it was just so great. And did that decision come from you? Was that something that the that the um, that the brothers that decided on? As the brothers, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's just great. It's such yeah. a great choice, and I think just so flawlessly executed. I absolutely yeah. loved it. Um, Thank you. A couple of things I wanted to talk about before we wrap up. There, uh, it looks as though you're using an infrared lens or infrared sensor, uh, not lens, yeah. infrared sensor. In earlier in the film, we're kind of outside. We had this sort of white look all around, and it was um, when Cherry experiences ecstasy for the first time, if I if yeah. I remember correctly. I want to talk about the use of that 
um, technique because I don't think we've mentioned that on the show before. And I know it's something that people have, um, people like to experiment with. Um, talk to us about your decision to use this kind of infrared look and what that ultimately means. Uh, just to set the scene, you know, um, after Cherry first sees Emily and they have their little conversation out in the school courtyard, he's fallen for her. Um, and um, he doesn't see her again for a little bit, but he uh, runs into these these kids from Shaker Heights, a suburb of Cleveland, who um, offer him ecstasy for his Xanax that he takes his medication. So he makes a trade and he takes ecstasy and they take him to this party. And he's having this sort of uh, outer body experience on drugs um, when he runs into Emily at the par- this at this party. And he's so smitten by her that as he talks to her, you can kind of see that she's sort of grounding him. She's like bringing him back to earth and sort of giving him some warmth and comfort and what otherwise is like, whoa, what's happening to me kind of moment. Yeah. So how did we do that visually? We used a 3D rig. So we had two cameras. Um, Ordinarily, they would be offset slightly, but our two cameras were lined up to create the exact same frame. One of them was a normal color camera, and the second one was a camera that was set up for infrared. And you do that in the digital world by, um, there's a a filter which ordinarily, in front of the sensor, which cuts out all the infrared light, which is non-visible light. It's light at the end of the spectrum that humans don't see. Um, So it messes up the sensor if you don't have it in but if you put it in it will allow the infrared light to come in and then you can use a uh, an infrared filter which is a filter which blocks visible light and only lets infrared light in Um, and this is a technique that was done on film for you know for decades uh, really initially to um, to do to examine like um, living things like and see the chlorophyll in uh, uh, vegetation. And yeah. um, so that was sort of the history of infrared. Um, and now we had these two images that were, were the exact same composition and frame, but one was infrared and one was, um, uh, was, was normal color. So what it did was by choosing shot to shot to shot to shot, how much of the infrared you used and how much of the color you used, you know, uh, 80%, 20%, or 50-50, or 80-20, you could um, you could change the tonality of, of the image. So when Cherry first comes to the party, he's totally bonked out, and it's full-out infrared, and then as he sees her and she sort of grounds him and brings him to earth, you get little by little, uh, the color becomes sort of more normal and if anything, slightly romantic and, you know, he's just loving talking to her. And then there's these sort of subtle little, um, internal moments that are not part of the sync dialogue where you see like a hand on the coat and the rope and, and those, have a heavier degree of infrared in them. One of the fun things about shooting the scene was, you know, I really wanted that sort of glow in the flesh tone. And we actually got some infrared lights. Now, an infrared light, if I had one right here and I put it on my face, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't see any light on my face because it's all light that's not visible to the human eye. Yeah. So <laughs> it's very interesting when you have a close-up of an actor and you're lighting her and you um but you can't see what the light's doing. The only way to see it is to look through the infrared camera and then you you get a sense. So well, how are you monitoring um, that? Do, we, do you, are there like with, monitors that can that you can get that um feed from? 
Well, yeah, because the, 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 the output of the camera is infrared. So the, the, what the camera is putting out to the monitor is what you're going to see, you know. Oh, that's cool. But you weren't able to see the blending of the two cameras, with your, or were with you? Your, no, 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 no. Okay, so I you mean, had so you could do a, rig, you could do a rough overlay with your video assist, but not really. Yeah, yeah. So you were able to either get the regular, you know, just the the regular shot or the infrared shot in your monitoring. But this was a three D rig, not meant for three D, but just so that you can have two cameras giving you the same image. That's such a great use of that infrared. Um, and it looks so cool. And you, you almost don't even, the giveaway that it's infrared is the very beginning of that scene because it's all kind of that white. But then after yeah. that, it's almost like, well, maybe it wasn't infrared. Maybe this was yeah. all done in post because you start seeing colors incorporated into it. So it was really cool. Yeah, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, how much to use it, how long to use it. You know, I probably would have liked to have used it a little more, but I, I thought it was very effective. I mean, to be perfectly honest, my only disappointment was that when I did the initial test, uh, it was earlier in the year, um, and there was more vegetation. And then, and I, I, I fought unsuccessfully to shoot the scene very early in the year. Um, but by the time we did, a lot of the vegetation was gone. So that's where you would have really seen the effect a little more. But yeah. I, you know, it's. Uh, as always, uh, very often, you know, less is more. Yes, certainly. And the last thing I want to talk to you about is just your experience um, working with the directors, Russo brothers. What was that like? Oh, it, it was amazing. I mean, it was it was really, um, I know everybody says this about every director, but it, it, it honestly was one of the, um, you know, best experiences of my career. On so many levels, you know, one, they were... Um, you know, they had this amazing script and they were pushing me to be bold and embracing the, you know, some of the most ridiculous things I offered. Um, but also, you know, their passion, their commitment to the story they were telling. And in particular, because they were telling a story that took place in Cleveland and we were shooting in Cleveland and they grew up in Cleveland. Mm. And, you know, it's so rare that you do a movie where, it's a true story and you're doing it where it really happened. And, you know, all of those things lined up. Um, and um, I, I just found between that, between, you know, Tom Holland's experience, uh, it was really um, uh, not as his performance. It, it was very inspiring. It was, it, was, it was really a joy to work with. And, you know, Joel and Anthony are very passionate and it's, it's funny because they're such family people and they're, they, they, you know, they love each other so much, but they'll argue, you know, they, they and, it, you know, this, I had worked with them as producers, but never as a director and they will, you know, you'll set something up or you'll start to get ready to do something and, and they will like, no, 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 and, you know, argue with you or argue with each other. No, no, with each other. And yeah. as a, as the new kid in school, I was like, Oh my God. And then they would just <laughs> turn to you both and they go, okay, so you got it. We're going to do the, da, da, da. And I'd be like, oh, I guess that was just two Italians talking to each other. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It happens. Believe me, I know. Yeah. This is yeah. basically how every yeah. single family dinner is. It's a lot of yeah. arguing. And then, yeah. you know, you have friends over and they're like, wow, you guys yell a lot. Then, no, that's talking. That's how we talk. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so that's what I, 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 I do. I, I must admit my first time to Italy as a, as a, as a teenager, uh, two of the biggest takeaways were one, uh, <laughs> yeah, people did a lot of that. And the other one was that uh, my first meal out, I there was a big family next to us with a, a, a lot of kids and a lot of people and very, very noisy. And then all of a sudden it got really quiet and I kind of looked over like, well, what happened? And the food had come and they were all eating. And it got really quiet. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. They're not talking anymore. And, went back to, and then all of a sudden I heard the noise again. I looked over and they had finished the first course and they were waiting for the next course. And it <laughs> went like that for the whole night. It would be like this symphony of voices and then silence and just clink, 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 choo, yes. choo, choo, choo. And then eating, <laughs> yelling, explosion. eating, yeah. yelling. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. You had mentioned that, you know, the, the Russo brothers were really pushing you to um, be bold. Now you got to do a lot in this movie. I mean, you you basically got to make 
five movies in one movie. And you got to play with a lot of different techniques in this. Mm -hmm. Was there something you wanted to do that they just said, you know what, Tom? No, it, I just can't. It's too much. Oh, yeah. They, I mean, I can't remember anything specific, but trust me, they didn't take every idea I gave them. Um, I can't. Yeah, you know, I can't right off the top of my head think of any <laughs> yeah. heart, heartbreak I had, but but it was you know the interesting thing about it was one thing that I sort of took away from it, and I had a similar experience on the movie before with Spike Lee, which was that if you're going to offer an idea, think it through before you offer it, and make sure you want to do it because once they say yes, you're doing it. You know, and it was Good just advice. like the, you know, doing everything with one lens. That was like, you know, I had to really before I knew before I offered this up, you know, I better really think this through because uh, let me think about it. <laughs> and then, uh, yep, I'm confident. Boom. So I went to them and, you know, they said yes. But, you know, if I if I wasn't totally sure and uh, they said yes, it would have been just too effing bad. Were you nervous at all that you wouldn't be able to maintain consistency throughout the film with so many techniques going on? Well, you know, I've had this a few times in my career, and I, I think most notably of Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, Three Kings, and now Cherry, uh, films that are really almost like uh, collage films, I call them, you know, where the uniformity is the variety hmm. and um i think that uh um it's 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 always been the biggest challenge when you go down the road of combining different techniques and looks of how you do it in a way that uh they don't just jump out as camera trickery and you know fun for fun's sake uh, I, I think it's really important at the beginning of a movie that you kind of sell the audience the kind of world that we're going to be operating in. And when you do that, and Three Kings was a good example, when you do it early on and with a consistency, then as the thing evolves, people will accept it, even if it's a very stylized, you know, kind of um, uh, bold language that you've chosen. So, yeah, I'm. All, that's always the the biggest worry is that it 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 uh, th that the movie doesn't just become a, a bunch of you know cool techniques and you know show off your camera. Yeah, well, I think the film is. I mean, it's great. The acting is amazing. Directing is great. The cinematography, of course. I think there's a lot in there for filmmakers to really enjoy and dig into because there is so much to kind of play with. But just as an average viewer, I think it feels very cohesive all the way through, and it and it evolves with the characters. So, I mean, you guys did just a fantastic job, and I strongly suggest all you guys watching, check yeah. it out. It's called Cherry. It's on Apple TV+. Plus, and um, you can find Newton Thomas Siegel. We'll put a link to his Instagram. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, if, yeah. you smile. Now I have right? to put, this now, is, uh, just because I always forget to look at it, so I better start putting pictures on. Uh, hey, well, now yeah. we're promoting it, so you yeah. got to give us a little something out there. But, okay. Um, but yes, I mean, film is fantastic. Everybody, check it out. Apple TV Plus. It's called Cherry, and of course, Newton Thomas Siegel. Thank you so much for coming back on Go Creative Show, and uh, already My looking pleasure. forward to your next project. I know you said you're in London now. What are you working on? Uh, I'm back with the Russos uh, doing a um, a series for um, Amazon called Citadel, which oh, is nice. um, uh, it was created by the Russos with Josh Applebaum, and it's it's kind of um, believe it or not, it's like part uh, Mission Impossible, part um, you know. Uh, Eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. So wow, put those that two, is an unlikely pairing. Put those together in your mind, and uh, I'll leave it at that. And you, you'll have to wait a year to figure out what the hell that means. Well, please do come back to talk about it because we love having you on, and your work is just fantastic. So thank you. My pleasure. All right, I want to thank Newton Thomas Siegel for coming on the show and talking about his work on Cherry on Apple TV+. Plus. So all of you guys need to check that out. You also need to check out the website for our producer, Connor Crosby. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com. And Dave Siegel over at SiegelSounds.com. He is the one that mixes and masters and makes the show sound so good. You can 
find him over there. Of course, all things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com, including all the show notes from this episode and all previous episodes. Don't forget, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, especially YouTube, because we put a lot of exclusive content there just for our YouTube family. And of course, we want you to also support our sponsor, MZ Education for Creatives. Of course, get 20% with the coupon code GCS20 at checkout for 20% off of MZ Education for Creatives over there at gocreativeshow.com forward slash MZ. All right, with that, we will see you guys next week on another episode of the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers.